Well, tonight, um, I know that so we talked about the fact of us you know, continuing to do Hebrews on Wednesday nights. Well, this first Wednesday, we're, uh, we're not going to do that because on this past Sunday, I told you that we, we talked about the subject of uh, both milk or meat and uh, deciding those things. And so tonight, I want to talk to you for, you know, for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for tonight about how to study the Bible. So that way you can get, you know, learn, you know, how to get into the meat of God's word and how to go into the deeper things. And, and uh, there's some things that are uh, very plain, you know, as far as, you know, Bible study and being able to do that. And then there's some things I'm going to explain tonight that you're going to go, okay, that seems a little, you know, a little more difficult, you know, kind of a thing. Well, that's going to be kind of, I guess, meat in this way as far as studying God's word. So uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, then also Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 2, verse, uh, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Hebrews 5, 14, we just read this on Sunday, but I want to read it uh, tonight as well. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Let's pray over God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit tonight. Lord, that we would understand, uh, Lord, how to rightly divide the word of truth. Lord, how, that we'd be able to uh, look at your word, understand it, and know that, um, that for one thing that we're understanding it, we're growing in the grace and the knowledge of you. And the other uh, thing is, is that we know that we're staying away from heresy because we're doing um, because we're, we are rightly dividing those things. Now, Lord, I thank you, God, for tonight. Lord, I pray that you would uh, use me, Lord, to preach your word, to be able to convey the, uh, these truths in Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said, uh, at, uh, on, I said this on Sunday, but reiterate it uh, tonight. If you have any questions, obviously, afterwards, after I'm done, um, we'll, uh, you know, I'll try to answer them as best as I can. And this is not like the most exhaustive, you know, way of, of uh, studying the Bible, but, uh, and you may have some ideas as well, but I was going to give you what has helped me um, th- through the years and stu- uh, through the years being able to understand God's word. So the first thing is, is obviously Bible interpretation. Here's one of the biggest things that we must understand that Jesus Christ obviously is the same thing yesterday, today, and forever. He, we know that he doesn't change. There's a lot of people preaching nowadays that the God of the Old Testament is a different God in the New Testament. That's not, you know, uh, what we see in the Scripture. The Bible says, uh, specifically says, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. He doesn't change. Jesus Christ, you know, the Old Testament is the same as he is in the New Testament. That people will sit there and, and, and try to say, well, he's meaner. In the Old Testament, he's nicer in, you know, the, the New Testament. They haven't read, you know, uh, Revelation. They haven't read a lot of the areas where people were being persecuted and everything else. The same that was happening, uh, that, that's, that's ha- that was happening in the Old Testament is happening in the New Testament as well and continues to go on uh, during the day. I think most of the time uh, people think that just because they live in America and they don't see that persecution, they don't see in pe- uh, people being murdered and martyred and all that for their faith, they think, oh, well, no, it's, it's different, that, you know, God's nicer, you know, that he's nicer, you know, that he treats uh, sin with kid gloves, um, that it's okay, you know, you're free to sin, it's okay for you to do whatever you want, but he is the same, as it says here in verse 8, it says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same God no matter what. He's not bipolar, you know, he, he doesn't change. He's not like how he, you know, nice in one spot, mean in the other. He's not bipolar. He doesn't change back and forth. He doesn't have multiple personalities. He is the same. I feel like I shouldn't have to, like, you know, reiterate that, but there are people out there that feel that, you know, uh, that they want to do that. Why? Because it makes it easier on them. They, they make it to where he's different so that way they can treat the Bible differently in, in, you know, in the New Testament as opposed to the Old Testament. And here's the, th- here's the thing. There's no new thing under the sun. There's no new thing. This has been going on for a long time. People have been trying to, to do this, as, you know, since, you know, since the Bible's been written, is that people have been trying, you know, different things. And even before the Bible was written, they were trying to get away with things that, you know, that were against God. 
and, and trying to manipulate his word. I mean, think about in the Garden of, uh, Garden of Eden. You know, the serpent said what? Hath God said. Trying to get people to question God's word, trying to, you know, get it to, you know, people to think that God was saying something different than what he originally said. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9 says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. So all the false religions, all the, you know, fal- uh, cults and, and different things, you know, false religions and all that, there's no new thing uh, under the sun. All it is is those same, you know, things that they were using back in the day, they just repackaged them and renamed them. So if we think that, like, Islam is something new, no, it's been like that, you know, for the longest time because, you know what, uh, Jacob and Esau have been fighting since, you know, what, Genesis chapter 14, Genesis chapter 12. And so it's, there's no new thing under the sun. One of the things when you're looking at Bible interpretation is context. When we say context, this is what I mean by the word context. That word, you know, I'm going to break it, you know, break down just the beginning part. Con in Latin means with. So in other words, it means with the text. That's what I mean when I say you you got to use context. Sometimes you people say, well, you got to know the context. You know, you got to know the society. You know, you got to know the customs. You got to know the culture. You got to know the background. And the reason why they do that is so they can change the word of God. Oh, well, we're, you know, that was because this happened back then. You know what? Well, we're different now than we were before. Remember, there's no new thing under the sun. And some people will say, well, you know, Pastor, how can you sit there and say that? You know, cultures have changed and everything else. But remember, we just read that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That, that context, that with the text, what do I mean is the fact that you can find the context usually either in the sentence before the verse or the sentence after the verse. If you can't find it there, read the whole chapter. If you can't find it there, read the chapter before, read the chapter after. If you can't find it there, read the, read the entire book to find out the context of that verse. That's what I mean by the context. You're using the Bible to define itself. Okay? That's what I mean, you know, by that. Uh, because, like I said, oftentimes, you know, people want to change what God's word says. The thing is, is that, you know, what, what we need to realize is that backgrounds, and, and culture and society and customs, they all change. He doesn't. John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and, and the Word was God. In other words, that there wasn't any cultures or any society or customs at the beginning. All there was was the Word, and that was it. At the beginning of everything, what? God spoke. You know, the word was there before the foundations of the, uh, uh, of the world, of the earth. And so what we need to realize is cultures, all those people change, all that kind of stuff, they all change. God does not. He remains steadfast through everything. He's the same, like I said, same yesterday, today, and forever. Too many times people want to use these false methods of, of, of using, saying, well, i got to read it in context, and they want to, what they want to do is they, they want to change the meaning of what the Bible says. Like adultery. Well, adultery, is, you know, they'll say, you know what, well, adult, this is what, how they defined adultery back then in those days. Or this is what they wanted to do, you know, this is how they defined alcohol. I mean, how much of an argument has been made over whether Christians should drink alcohol or not? Well, in this culture, it was okay for them to do. In this one, it wasn't. And, and what, are, what does the Bible say? It says, don't be drunk with wine. But yet they say, well, in this culture, you know, it was over. You know, or the fact of abortion. Now we think that we've evolved so much that now we have science to show, hey, we can tell you when it's a baby and when it's just a fetus. Life starts at conception, the Bible tells us. So it's all a fact of people trying to change God's word and trying to change the interpretation and everything else. They don't want to take what it says um, you know, for face value because they don't want to believe God's word. It's their way of getting out of it. And they're not going to. They can sit there and try and change it and uh, suit their own needs, but the thing is, is that God's going to judge them on that as he's going to judge us on whether or not we're actually rightly dividing the word of truth. 
Now let's look at, I want to look at uh, uh, Jeremiah 29. I want to kind of jump around a little bit here, but I want us to, to realize some, some things that when we look at it, because obviously in Jeremiah 29, there's a very famous verse, you know, uh, verse 11 that everybody focuses on. But the thing is, is that if we were to realize and look at the context of Jeremiah 29, we would realize that that verse comes in the middle of God rebuking and getting ready to tell his, his people, these are believers, what he's going to do to them when they don't listen. People are like, but that's such a blessing of, of a verse. It is a blessing of a verse. That's when we're obedient. That, that's when he gives that to us. So Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 8 through 19. It says, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of, is, uh, the God of Israel. Now pay attention throughout this portion that I'm going to read, how many times it says, for thus saith the Lord, and then there's going to be a spot that says, for you said. For you said. So there's going to be a whole bunch of times, where, yes, where God is speaking, and then there's also a portion where God's people are going to come back and say, well, God said this, and he didn't. Okay? So let's go uh, back here. Verse 8. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you. Hearken not, uh, neither hearken to their dreams which ye, uh, ye cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you. In my name I have not sent them, saith the Lord. So that first portion, he's talking to his people, saying, you know what, there are prophets among you. What kind of prophets are these? False prophets. These are diviners. These are like astrologers nowadays or, you know, fortune tellers, okay? And he's saying that you're listening to them and you're not listening to me. Let's go on. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years uh, be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. So what's God telling them? He said, I'm going to cause you to return to this place. What place is he going to have him return to? Babylon. Is Babylon, uh, when it's mentioned in the Bible, is it ever mentioned fondly? Is it ever mentioned like in a good light? No. But God says, I'm going to return to you to that place. Okay? It says, and then he goes on to say, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. There's that verse 29, or sorry, that verse 11 in, in chapter 29 that most people just love and they just go right to. Then it goes on to say, it says, Then shall ye call up upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me when, uh, when ye shall, uh, shall search for me with all your heart. I will, be, uh, I will be found of you, saith the Lord. I will turn away your captivity. I will gather you from all nations and from all the places I, uh, where I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I cause you to be carried away captive. So that's the positive part. What is he telling him? He says, you know what? You call upon me, I'm going to come to you. But what does he go on? He says, he says this. He says, but ye have said. Who's ye? You. It's them that, you know, there it says, but you have said. So this are the, these are the people speaking. It says, the Lord hath raised up prophets in Babylon. Know that thus saith the Lord of the king that sitteth upon the throne of David and of all the people that dwelleth in this city and of your brethren that are not gone forth with you into captivity. So right there he's telling, you know, this is what the people are saying. This is what the people are doing. They're, saying, they're putting words in God's mouth, and God's like, I never said those things. He's like, if you're, if you're obedient, you get what, you, what I just read, that you'll call upon me, he's going to go, and he's going to hearken unto you, and you'll seek him, and you'll find him. I mean, all these things. But then he's going to tell, you, then he's gonna tell them what happens when they're disobedient and when they don't follow him. Let's go on. It says, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Behold, I will send upon, you, upon them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and will make them like vile figs that cannot be eaten. They are so evil, and I will persecute them with the sword, with the, fam with the famine, and with the pestilence, and will, and will deliver them to be removed 
to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse and an astonishment and a hissing and a reproach among all the nations whither I have driven them. This is where he comes out and says it. Because they have not hearkened my words, saith the Lord, which I sent unto them by my servants, the prophets, rising, uh, raising up early, rising up early and sending them, but ye would not hear, saith the Lord. So God tells you, this is what's going to happen to you if you listen to me, and this is what's going to happen if you don't listen to me. How many of you want to listen to him, right? But a lot of times we miss, we miss what the Bible says where it says, because ye have said. And we will read prophets and go, oh, well, prophets, ought to, I mean, that's got to be a good thing, right? No, you have to read the context and find out, hey, the, the, con, uh, the prophets in this context are what? False. Because they're, they're lumped with diviners, with astrologers, with uh, fortune tellers. You know, Miss Cleo, back in the day, if you ever, what, you remember those in the 1980s, Miss Cleo, on there, uh, you know, she got found out that she was false. But, like all the other ones. But then he goes, you know, and then he says what? And a lot of times people don't want to, you know, don't want to look at what God says when we're disobedient. And remember, God does this, why? Because he wants us to turn to him. He wants us to always be in a right relationship to him. But he says, if you continue to backslide, if you continue to, to, to not listen to me, what do you tell him? He says, he says I'm going to send upon him the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and that he's going to deliver them to be, uh, to, be removed, uh, to be removed to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, an astonishment, a hissing, and a reproach. He does all this, why? Because he wants us to remain in good fellowship with him. People say, well, that's a mean God. No, it isn't. Because think about how many times that maybe you've had a relationship that was on the rocks and everything else, and, and you, knew, you knew that no matter what you told that person, that they weren't going to listen to you. And you're like, I, I'm telling you, if you keep doing this, you're going to end up jail, you're going to do this, you're going to end up all these things, and they don't listen to you. Do you tell them because you hate them? No, you tell them because you love them. That's why God's telling them, you know what? If you listen to me, I'm going to be right there for you. But if you don't, I'm going to let all these things come upon you. So hopefully you turn back. It's also called tough love. So anyways, we see, you know, we see God doing that. So that's all a matter of context that we look at that whole entire thing. Now, you know, like if you were to look at one or two, or if you were to look at Jeremiah 29, 11, um, just God just wants to bless me. But if you look at the, ter- uh, you know, the entire portion, and I didn't even read the entire, uh, the, the whole chapter, but if you read the context of it, you figure, you know, you figure it out. God's saying, you know what, if you do this, things are going to be well for you. And if you don't do them, they're not going to be well for you. Okay? So number two is this, don't do this. Don't do this, all right? Is the fact that, and I, I say this a lot, and a lot of times people don't understand why, but I'm not a fan of commentaries. Don't go to commentaries. Don't go to lexicons. Don't go to devotionals. Don't do all those things. A lot of times people say, well, I don't understand what it's saying. But here's a, here's a, big, reason, uh, here's a big reason why I say, you know what? Read what the Bible says. Don't get a Bible with study notes. People are like, well, how am I supposed to understand it? I can't understand it. Well, because the study notes are written by man. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing things with spiritual, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So learn and, and study what God's word says. Go to God's word first. Go to God's word, you know, first go to God's word, you know, word always. And you say, well, I don't know if I can understand it. You know what? The Bible has a, a, a promises about this. That he said he's going to help you. John chapter 16, verse 13 says, How be it, he, the spirit of truth, is come. He will guide you into all truth. For uh, he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. When you, right before you're getting ready to, you know, start studying God's word and, and those things, do you ask the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth? 
Because God's word says that he's going to do that. He says he will guide you into all truth. We don't have to question that. We don't have to wonder that. I, that's one of the things I ask. And you know, sometimes I say, say, you know, is it that easy? Yes, it is that easy. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God says, you know what? The Holy Spirit is your commentary. The Holy Spirit's going to guide you into all truth. And you know what? And you can believe the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he's God. I don't, I mean, that's one of the big, you know, big things that, you know, someone uh, recently had told me. They said, well, you know, what, they asked me what commentary and what concordance and what, you know, all this other stuff. You know, what study notes do you use? What, whatever. And I wasn't trying to be, you know, I wasn't trying to be, uh, you know, uh, just flipping about it or, you know, just, act, you know, acting like I know everything. It's because I don't know everything. I know I don't know everything. But I just said, you know, the Holy Spirit. That's your commentary. You know, that's your commentator on the word of God. He's an elite. Uh, the Bible says he, that he will guide you into all truth. Right? I mean, if we believe, if we believe, uh, if we believe these verses, you know, about the fact that the Holy Spirit teaches us and guides us, right? Then like verses like Jeremiah 29, 13, which we just read, we believe too, right? Which says, and ye shall seek me and find me and when you shall uh, search for me with all of your heart. So the Bible says that when you seek, you, know, you, you seek him, you're going to find him when you search with him with all of your heart. Did you not do that at the moment of salvation when you believed on him, when you trusted in him to, to save you? So if you believed on him and you trusted him, you sought him with all of your heart, then why is it that when it comes to the word of God and him you know, explaining it to you, sometimes we just go, okay, I'm going to go get a devotional. I'm going to go get a commentary. I'm going to go find out what somebody else said. The Bible says that he will guide you into all truth. And you know what? Here's, here's something that people need to realize, and this is not to be a, um, like some sort of dig or anything else. I say this because I know this, and I know there's other ones in this room that you know, are the same uh, as well. You're not going to understand everything in the Bible. And so many times people get stuck on what they don't know instead of what God has revealed to them. If you read through an entire chapter and you get like one verse out of that, praise God. If you, you know, say, you know what, I want to know more, just dig into it even more and God's going to give it to you, right? Because he says what? You shall seek me and find me. So when you seek after him, he's going to do what? He's going to show you more. I mean, it's the same thing like in any kind of marriage. I mean, after the first or second date, you know, obviously before you get married, you kind of, you know, you, you may be like, oh, you know what, I, I kind of like this person. And as you move on, you're like, you know, I think I could spend the rest of my life with this person. And then that question comes along. But the thing is, is because you're getting to know them more, you're spending more time with them, you're kind of, you know, uh, you're kind of probing and asking those, you know, deep questions that maybe you haven't asked somebody before. And you're like, I like what I hear. I like what I'm finding out, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know of anyone that said, man, I, whew, this person's a, a horrible person. I think I love them. But the more you find out about them, the more you love them, and you're like, hey, you know what? I can spend the rest of my life with them. And the more and more that I dig into God's word and, and, and spend time with them, the more, I, you know, the more I love them. He already loves me unconditionally. So the more I love them and want to you know, say, hey, you know, I definitely want to spend the, you know, the rest of my life with them, right? But that's one of the reasons is the fact that using commentaries and lexicons and all that kind of stuff, and I'm not saying that, you know, um, like you should just ward them off like they're like the worst thing ever, but I'm saying go to the Bible first. Always go to there and study it. And then, you know what, maybe if, if it's possible you want to double check, make sure that a few people are on the same page as you, you know, like, hey, this is how I interpret it. I'm, I want to make sure I'm not a, her you know, a heretic here. You know, that I'm coming up with some new heresy. Oh, you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, they're on, uh, right on the same page. But make sure that if you use a commentary or a lexicon of someone's, make sure you know what they, what they taught and what they believed. Because like I said, they're man. They're not the Holy Spirit. Some people go, well, you know what? You know, 
I don't believe everything this, this teacher te- uh, you know, taught, but um, you know, there's a couple things over here. Well, you've got to dissect all that junk when you just go to the Holy Spirit and say, hey, you know what, What's, can you explain this to me? And like I said, you're not going to understand everything in the Bible. That's the reason why you can read it a hundred times and then come back a hundred and one, and all of a sudden, a, all of a sudden, a new verse has popped out at you that you never, you know, saw before, right? Like I said, don't rely upon them, because in First Corinthians chapter two, verse uh, fourteen, it says, "But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him; neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned." You don't know if that commentator, the person that's writing that commentary, you don't even know if that person's saved a lot of the times. That's why I say, know the, you know, make sure you check their background. You know, you, you know what they taught, you know what they believed, because they might or may not even be saved. You're like, well, it's a commentary. They're supposed to be saved. Doesn't always happen. Some people write commentaries to make money. They don't do it because they, they love Jesus. They're just like, hey, you know what? I can make money off of this. I'm going to do it. What we need to do is be like those that are in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Let's look at verses 10 through 12. And it says, And the brethren immediately sent, to, uh, sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of the mind and study, or, or sorry, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were, uh, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. The Bereans knew exactly, because the Bible says that they searched the scriptures daily. They heard Paul and Silas preaching, and then they didn't just take it at face value and be like, oh, that's Paul and Silas, I've heard about them. You know, they said, you know what? I hear them, but I'm going to make sure what they're saying actually lines up with the Word of God. That's the way we need to be. That if, if uh, you know, if I get up here or whatever, you say something, you're like, okay, that doesn't seem, you know, right? Like I say, well, for one thing, talk to me about it. But then, cause, because then together we can actually search the Scriptures together and find, you know, and find what is true. And, I, and you, know, you know that I've got, uh, that I have, not been, you know, arrogant or cocky to the point where I have not admitted, you know, where I've, you know, preached something that wasn't right. I've got up a few times and said, you know what, I wasn't right on this issue, or I wasn't right teaching this doctrine, okay? So that's what we need to do, right? We need to be like the Bereans and study the scriptures to make, you know, as it says, um, that, uh, that those things were so that they were right, that that's what the Bible said. They weren't going to just take some, you know, so, you know, somebody off the street, some famous person, and go, oh, yeah, well, this is Pastor so-and-so. I see in his TV channel, and, uh, I, you know, I can believe whatever. No, they said they searched, it. They searched the Bible. Cause, because the reason why is because the Bible is the final authority. That is our final authority. It's not the final authority on everything. If we don't believe the Bible, then why are we here? To be honest, we might as well go listen to a man. If we wanted to do that, and I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, trying to, you know, uh, you know, uh, shoot arrows at, you know, some, you know, whatever. But if we wanted that, why don't we just go to the Catholic Church? They have a Pope that tells you what to believe and not to believe. They don't believe the Bible. They have them in there. But if the Pope says, I don't believe that, I believe this, they go with the Pope. They don't go with what the Bible says. And by the way, the Bible, you know, they have is completely different than, the, you know, than the actual real Bible. Here's the other thing. You don't need to understand Greek and Hebrew to understand the Bible. You don't, need to, you don't need to understand, you don't need to learn Greek or Hebrew to understand the Bible. People sit there and go, well, I got to you know, find the, the deep things of God. I got to learn Greek and Hebrew. You know who you sound like? The Muslim. Because the Muslim says that in order for you to completely understand what the Quran says, you better learn Arabic. Because the English, it always loses something in translation. If we believe that God can preserve his word, that God keeps his word, don't you think that when they translate it, 
God's going to keep it and preserve it? That how it was, how it was written in that language is going to say the exact same thing that it says in our language? Or the, uh, am I the only one that believes that? I mean, it's just it's one of those things that, yes, I understand there are different words for different things, but the, th- the same concept, the same, you know, and, and, and that's not in all things because there's only a couple things where there's maybe a word picture that we're like, okay, I may not understand that or that doesn't quite translate. But then the, the, the translators are supposed to sit there and, and go, okay, what, how would this translate into, uh, you know, over here? But, you know, everything is the same. You shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't read, go from one Bible to the next Bible to the next Bible to the next Bible, and they all say something different. In which we know that, you know, for some of, uh, some, some of the times that I've uh, preached on it, that there are Bibles that change things along the line. You guys with me so far? Some of you are going, okay, we're, are, are we going to get to the fact of like learning how to study it? Well, we have to understand some things, obviously, about God's word first, and you know, then that. This last part is the fact, of, you know, this, or this, this next point is the vast majority of studying. Okay, so other than context, other than you know, other than context, you need to look for key words, just you know, certain words in general and phrases. So key words and phrases. All right. Sometimes, you know, in the Bible, you know, in this point, I'm, I'm just going to you know, tell you right now, I know that it works with the Bible that I have. I have a King James Bible. I know that it works. I cannot say that for every single other Bible out there. Okay? I make that preference. I'm just telling you that right now. But if you're looking for a word and you want the definition of the word, it's, you can go to the first usage of it, and oftentimes, uh, you know, more, uh, say like 95% of the time, that word is either in that same in that same verse, or it's in the verse before or after, or it's in that you know that chapter. But it will show you you know what that word means. And the only dictionary that I can you know um, that I can you know recommend to you, like I say, I'm talking you know strictly from King James, is the Webster's 1828 dictionary. He said, well, we're that's like over it's almost 200 years old. They have them in a lot of um, and a lot of uh, uh, software and computer software, and they have you know, and uh, you can actually still buy them online. But the thing is, is that, um, or you know, there's actually a website I believe it's like Webster's 1828 Dictionary dot com, and it's actually on there as well. But the reason why I say that because that was the last dictionary to use the first usage of the word that the Bible that the Bible uses to define the word, because. For people that don't know, the Bible itself actually set the English language. When English was, you know, was, was first being developed and people were you know, talking in English, but it kind of changed. Because you know how languages change after a while, you know that, right? When there's a new language, I mean, you want to think about it now. Like, th- there's words that are used today that, don't, you know, that mean something different than what they meant 50 years ago, Right? So language is always changing, but when, when, the, uh, when the, the translators began to write the Bible or began to translate the Bible, it set the, uh, the English language. It said, this is, you know, that we're coming together, this is what it was. Why? Because the world back then was based around the Bible. And those that were, and those that were translating it were setting it in place and, and, and solidifying the English language, Okay. So that's how they were. You know, that's how uh, you know. That's how people oftentimes, people oftentimes learned how to read and how to speak, because of the Bible. Nowadays, you're watching everything else and learning everything else, but that. But back in the day, they got that Bible, and that was what they. You know, that's how they learned. You know, how to write and read and everything else. Okay. So first usage, oftentimes, you know, there's there's uh, in Genesis chapter 18. Sorry, in Genesis chapter 10, verse 18. It actually, and I'll show you this, and it says, And the Aravite, and the, the Zemurite, and the, the Hamathite, and afterward, uh, afterward were the families of the Canaanite spread abroad. Well, oftentimes, people, we don't necessarily use the word abroad, okay? We don't necessarily say, 
You know, I'm going to go, you know, they went abroad. I mean, sometimes, you know, they do, but we don't often use it. Well, the, the thing is, is that if you look at the word, it says that, you know, the Can uh, says of the families, sorry, the, the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. Well, right next to it is the word spread. What does the dictionary say that abroad means? Widespread. So it defines itself right there, right? So then if you go on to, like I said, talk about, you know, certain phrases, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. We're going to see how certain phrases, how the Bible had defined those as well. And it says, uh, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it for him for righteousness. Now this was showing that back in the, you know, back even in Genesis, that believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, believing on the Lord, Jehovah, that's how you got saved. Because sometimes people say, well, people weren't saved in the Old Testament. Yes, they were. Because the reason why, well, for one thing, the reason why I know that is because if you go to Romans chapter 4, it quotes this verse speaking of salvation and about a person getting saved. Okay, so we'll go to Romans chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Or sorry, 2 and through 5. Romans chapter 4, verses 2 through 5. Take a little bit and drink while you're flipping over there. So in that part it says, and he believed in the Lord, all right? All right? And it says, and he counted it to him for righteousness. That means that Abraham got saved in the Old Testament. So in Romans chapter 4, starting at verse 2, it says this. For if Abraham were justified, justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture... Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So we see back then, you know, obviously, you know, it's still showing the fact that they got saved back in the, you know, back then. That they had to believe on the Lord. It's not something new. I'm going to get to the fact because people say, well, no, um, they were saved because of animal sacrifices. No, they weren't. People were not saved because of animal sacrifices. The animal sacrifices were a foreshadowing of what had to happen in order for, you know, uh, in order for Jesus Christ when he came. What is Jesus Christ? The perfect sacrifice. Pointing that back. So all the sacrifices that you know, happened in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus Christ. And what his salvation accomplishes. Okay? Am I losing anyone? Everybody still with me? All right. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. Because the Bible does have, uh, has no error, right? It's without error. Amen? Going along that line, you know, same thing, you know, for, you know, going off of, of phrases, but, you know, showing you that the Bible also is 100% accurate and true, that it, God didn't change salvation, okay? It was always the same. Even back in Genesis chapter 4, so I'm going back even further to the beginning of the Bible, and this is what it says. It says, and to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and, his, uh, and he called his name Enos. Then began people to call upon the name of the Lord. Sound familiar, that last part? Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. But doesn't it sound an awful like Romans chapter 10, verse 13, where it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's the same all the way through. I mean, these two verses show that there has, has, has always been just one way to be saved. Since the begin, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, sorry, the only one way to be saved since the beginning, and that it wasn't because of animal sacrifices. That it was what believing on the Lord, calling upon His name to be saved. Does, and that's what it says in the, in the New Testament as well. So God didn't change and say, "Well, you know, I'm going to do animal sacrifices back then, and then now all I'm going to do with Jesus Christ." He didn't change, you know, He didn't change what He was doing. 
All the animal sacrifices were a foreshadowing, and I can prove it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. Say, Pastor, if you, if you use Hebrews, how are you going to preach on, you know, how are you going to preach on Hebrews if you're using it for uh, tonight? Well, don't worry. There's, there's a lot in God's word. But Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, it says this. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. It is not possible. Bulls and goats did do, uh, didn't do a thing. All it was was to you know, kind of show the severity of those things because think about it. If they're in an agricultural you know, a, a way of living, I mean, Bobby and Miss Pat know this. You, everybody around here probably knows this, that if a farmer loses animals, what does he lose? Money, livelihood, food on the table. And Jesus is, is showing them, saying, that you know what, when you sin, you need to offer this animal and this animal. Doesn't it make you think, man, I better think twice about sinning? Doesn't it make you think? It should have caused them to because they're like, you know what, if, if I keep on doing the same thing over and over again, man, I'm, I'm going to be down to one cow pretty soon. You know, I, I'm not going to have that many goats left. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do. But it's all a foreshadowing. It was all a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ would accomplish being the final sacrifice. That's why the Bible says that he was sacrificed once and for all. He says, you know, that um, he says, you know, that we don't, you know, sacrifice him, uh, you know, uh, him over and over again. He was sacrificed once and for all. We don't, you know, keep sacrificing him over and over again, kind of like the Catholics uh, teach. You say, well, Catholics don't teach that. Yes, they do, because when they, uh, when they, uh, and this is a side note, but when they have communion, they believe in a thing called transubstantiation which teaches that when you take communion, you're literally, you know, those elements, the bread and the juice or the wine, because they actually use wine, those things literally turn into the flesh, the body of Jesus, and his blood. Literally, physically, they say that's what it, it turns into. And so it's them sacrificing Christ over and over and over again, week by week. Everybody, you know, on the same page thus far? So we see, like, we can, you know, look at certain keywords. We can look at certain phrases. Like I said, I can't really go, like, all that, you know, uh, you know too much in depth. But I'm trying to show you those things. First word usage, a lot of times, you know, will show you those things, you know, uh, as well that we talked about. But how do you, how do we study Bible prophecy? Do you need a special book to understand Bible prophecy? Well, yes, you do need a special book. It's called the Word of God. But let's look at this, all right? This one right here, I think I left my, uh, I believe I left myself enough time, you know, to go through this one. Because I'm going to go through a little bit of Bible prophecy, all right, just to kind of show you this. All right. Let's look up, you know, one of the big things in end times prophecy is the abomination of desolation, Right? Everybody knows about the abomination of desolations, uh, or desolation, and people will sit there and sometimes wonder and say, how did we, you know, because, you know, the, uh, sorry, the book of Revelation never says anything about the abomination of desolation. So how do we know what it is? Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, uh, 4, verse 15. And it says, And when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. And you say, well, because some people will look at this and specifically say, well, this is for a certain group of people, you know, the abomination of desolation. But what actually is the abomination of desolation? Okay. Well, I can take you over to uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 14, but it's, it also is going to say the same thing. Or you know, along the same lines, it says this. It says in, in verse 14 of Mark, uh, verse 14 of Mark 13, it says, but when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by 
Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not. Let him that readeth understand, then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. And so we see this part. For one thing, we see obviously it says the abomination, um, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Okay, so we look at it, it says, it says what? It says, standing where it ought not, right? So let's go look at Daniel the prophet. Daniel chapter 9. So we see the abomination. Jesus is talking about this in a future sense, saying that this is going to happen in the end times, right? Because there's people out there that will sit there and say this event already happened. Because there was a man by the name of uh, Tigris Epiphanes that, uh, that went into the temple and desecrated the temple. And people thought at that time, in Daniel's time, that this was that event. But there are things in, in the Bible that call them dual prophecy. It's a prophecy that's going to happen you know, uh, uh, in the next couple of years there. And then stuff that's going to happen later on down the line. Okay? And we have that. You know, the reason why we have dual prophecy? Because, yes, this event happened in Daniel's time. But Jesus is talking about it that it's going to happen in the end times. So it's a dual prophecy. Okay? But this one is going to be done perfectly. What do I mean by that? Well, think about back to um, Abraham and Isaac. Remember when he was getting ready to sacrifice his son on the altar? What did Abraham say? He said, the Lord will provide what? A lamb, right? What did he provide? Did he provide a lamb? He provided a ram. So there was partial you know, uh, fulfillment in that, that. Yes, that was for that time. But then it also is speaking of who? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That God is going to provide the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Dual prophecy. Okay? I hope I'm not like going you know, like way too deep on this one. But I'm, like I said, there's that dual prophecy that we see. And sometimes there are certain cases, and I'm not going to go into it tonight, but like there's times where like a triple prophecy almost happens. Or a true prophecy happens, okay? So in uh, Daniel chapter 9, hopefully you're there, verse 27. And it says, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the uh, ability, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he, he shall make it desolate, even it, or sorry, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So this is where we get the abomination of desolation. You can also read about it in Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. It says this, it said, And arms uh, shall stand on, uh, on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of, of strength, and shall take away uh, the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. So we see it again, of all these things are of what's supposed to happen, right? Even in uh, chapter 12, verse 11 of Daniel, it says, And from, that, uh, from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolation, uh, uh, sorry, the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall uh, be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So we see these, you know, back the, you know, back then. So obviously Jesus is talking about the New Testament. He says, "Hey, it, 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 it happened with Daniel, and you know what? But it happened with Daniel. It, it came to pass in Daniel's day." It's also going to come in, in the. Um, it's also going to come at the end of, uh, end of times. And you say, well, where does it say that? Well, for one thing, Jesus was always talking in a future sense. But if you uh, flip over to Revelation chapter thirteen, verse five, it says exactly what he said. Uh, what he said in Daniel chapter nine, where he says that he's that he's going to stand. He's going to stand up and say these things. Revelation uh, chapter thirteen, verse five says. And there was given unto him, who is this? The Antichrist. A mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. 
So that's because of the fact that where is this taking place? In the temple. That third temple that's going to be built, it says, it says what? It says that he's going to get up in that place and, you know, and speak great things and blasphemies. Well, what are those great things and blasphemies? He's going to, he's going to read. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. It says this, That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And actually, I need verse four, uh, verse four, because so I got to flip over there. I missed me a verse. Okay, it says, and it says. Uh, I went too far. I knew that didn't seem right. And it says, uh, okay, the man of perdition, verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So that's how we know the abomination of desolation. That's the reason why I say that, hey, you know what? The Antichrist is going to go into that temple and declare that he is God. Why? How do we know that? And that is the abomination of desolation. You say, well, Pastor, that's a lot of like moving around and everything else. But if you want to understand certain things, that's what you have to do. You have to go, you know, you're going to have to go back and forth. You, you know, Daniel and, and, and the book of Revelation, they, they intermix, they interjoin. The funny thing is that Daniel said himself that he didn't understand what he wrote. But I guarantee if Daniel had revelation, he would have. Because revelation is like the revealing of what Daniel said back in, you know, in, in the book of Daniel back then. And also, you, you know, God said that, uh, that he wasn't going to give him the understanding to understand it. That plays a big part into it, too. So those, those, those few things... I have a couple more things as well as far as um, things that can help you, re uh, you know, remember what you read really quick. There's a, uh, you know, these last couple are, are really uh, quick and fast. Uh, just remember SOAP, you know, SOAP. This is an acronym. Abby knows this one because I taught it to them up there, so. Uh, the S stands for Scripture. So when you're reading, you know, maybe you're reading a, a chapter and a verse sticks out to you, write down that scripture. Then go to the O, which is observation. What do you observe about that? One or two lines about that you know, in there. And then the A is application. How do you apply that to your life or how can you apply that to the things in your life? And then P is prayer. Pray that God, you know, pray that application, you know, that, that application for, you know, if it's specifically for you or somebody else or whatever, write out a prayer. These are all things you're writing out as you're going. And just have like a journal that you write those in. Some of the software um, and resources that I, that I use or have used, I already talked to you about the 1828, you know, dictionary. Um, I use uh, Cruden's Unabridged Concordance. Um, this Bible right here has... Uh, Westminster's, uh, you know, references in it that I use on that one. Um, I don't, you know, that's a cross-reference. I don't really, uh, uh, other ones, not as good, in my opinion. These some of the other stuff, uh, the, uh, like, Bible software as far as is eSword. You can find that both on, you know, Mac, PC, um, Android, I believe, and also iOS. You can find them on all those. I believe... Uh, yeah, on that one, next one, this is the one I mainly, this is the one I use now currently, is called Sword Searcher. That one's strictly for, um, for PC. It's not for your phone. But on my phone, I have an Android phone, and I use a, um, I use a software called um, And Bible, A-N-D, Bible. It's all one word. And you can download, they have a lot of different things on there if you want. To, to, they have like anywhere from books to commentaries to, to whatever. I always say, though, remember, if you're doing commentaries, make sure you know what they taught, what they believed. Um, like I said, Westminster Reference, and then the uh, and then uh, Cruden's you know, commentary. He said, well, that's not that much. I, I honestly don't. I just go to God's Word um, on those things. 
So anyways, if you want to uh, cut it, Abby, and then if you guys have questions, I'll 